Let me introduce uh, Roger Berkowitz, who is the chair of this morning. Roger Berkowitz is the assistant professor of politics, philosophy, and human rights at Bard College. He has a German, Greek, European philosophical background, like Hannah Arendt. He, he is academic director of Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College. And he wrote many books. Some, one of the last ones is, I think, Thinking in Dark Times. It's edited by him. Oh, yeah, OK. And what I like mostly with him is he has a, on the web website, he has a, a website, on, on the internet, he has a website called Vernunft.org. <laughs> and he has another thing which he does every week, and it's fantastic. It's the Arendt blog on the, on the Bard College. And he talks about a very open and very wide um, uh, subjects of the question what Hannah Arendt means and could mean in the debates today. And this blog is for everyone. Europe, America, China, very important. So take over. Um, first, so first of all, I want to thank the Villa Aurora for, for hosting this conference and inviting me and these really exceptional speakers. Um, as Mary Louise was just saying, Hannah Arendt is a public figure, became a public figure, and it's important that the public and public institutions uh, continue to uh, engage not just her, but the kinds of her, the kinds the ways that she approaches meaningful everyday political questions. Uh, that's what the Hannah Arendt Center uh, is an attempt to do, and I think this conference is, is structured in such a way to be really. Uh, wonderfully uh, engaged in her work as it impacts our common political world. And having it in the Villa Aurora, this exceptional place that in some way raises us above the valley and raises us also through its beauty to, um, to, a, to a world that's extraordinary, which is what she thought politics should be, that we should end up talking engage and, in a sense, raise ourselves up out of the ordinary into the extraordinary. We're, we're going to have three spectacularly interesting talks uh, in this panel. Uh, we, I, I hope that the speakers will speak for about 30 minutes, that's what I was told, uh, which would leave us close to an hour um, for discussion, which I think would be uh, important. Uh, I'm going to introduce each speaker before their paper, and, and we'll go in order. Uh, our first speaker is Andy Rabenbach. Uh, he is uh, a very distinguished professor. He's a professor at Princeton, where he teaches history. Um, he has written numerous books and edited more. Uh, one of the books that uh, has made a huge impact in many of our lives is The Human Motor, Energy, Fatigue, and the Origins of Modernity. Um, it's a book about labor, and labor power, the emergence of labor power. It's how the things of nature and man himself becomes a productive thing. Uh, one of the, f I, I love this line in it, which he says that labor power is a totalizing framework that subordinated all social activities to production. Uh, you can hear his interest in totalitarianism, I believe, there. Um, he, he has a, he, he's the co-editor of The Third Reich, a source book, which is, I think, coming out right now. It's out, just 2013. And he's also, uh, he's, he's, he's the co-founder as well of a journal that I'm sure many of you know, uh, New German Critique. He's gonna speak today with a paper that, at least as I understand it, is titled The Origins of Totalitarianism in Historical Perspective. So please wel welcome and Andy Robinbach. Thank you for the <clears throat> kind introduction. Um, I want to just begin by saying something about the title of my paper, The Origins of Totalitarianism in Historical Perspective. I use the phrase historical perspective in two senses of the word. One is historical perspective in the sense of contextualization, and the second is historical perspective in terms of the historical debate on the origins of totalitarianism, which continues, as you know, up to today. 1951 was surely an inauspicious year for the publication of a book in the United States almost entirely devoted to Nazism. On New Year's Day, 
massive Chinese and Korean troops overran UN border outposts and captured Seoul. In April, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were convicted of conspiracy to commit espionage and sentenced to death. On May 1st, 600,000 marchers in East Berlin carried portraits of Pieck, Grotewohl, and Stalin. In June, the Cambridge spies, Donald McLean and Guy Burgess, fled to the USSR, and in October, Stalin declared that he had the atomic bomb. President Truman asked Congress to officially declare the end of the war with Germany. And to make matters worse, Borscht Capades closed at the Royal Theater in New York after only 90 performances. These events were dimly present in one of the first reviews of Arendt's origins, Dwight McDonald's encomium in the new leader of May 14th. Quote, as Marx stripped the ideological veil from capitalism, McDonald wrote, so does she from totalitarianism. More telling are his wistful and ironic references to the good old Marxist days. And I think what's important about that kind of tone and those locutions is that they signify the left's leave taking from a youthful indiscretion or adolescent folly which Arendt obviously did not share. As is well known, she did not appreciate the Cold War appropriation of her arguments. Already in 1949, she described the political atmosphere. The red hysteria is in full throttle. And the American intellectuals, above all if they had a radical past, and in the course of the years had become anti-Stalinists, in part because they were really disillusioned, in part because they had gotten older, have to an extent synchronized themselves, and then she used the word Gleichschalkit, synchronized themselves with the State Department. Two years later, she took aim at the Cold War anti-communists in her famous essay, the ex-communists, which he compared with the anti-communists. But what made the origins especially vulnerable to criticism was the virtual absence in the book of a sustained discussion of the role of Marxism and, and Leninism in, in Stalinism, or more precisely, the importance of respectable philosophical traditions such as Marxism in the creation and perpetuation of totalitarianism. Arndt planned to respond to her critics with a book specifically devoted to the problem of Marxism and politics, but apart from a few chapters and some lectures, it remained unpublished. There was, however, one exception. At the height of the Cold War, the following year, she published an extensive review of a book entitled Bolshevism, an introduction to Soviet communism, written by her friend, the Catholic political theorist Valdemar Gorian in the Partisan Review. Arndt enumerated three basic themes of Gorian's study. One, an unbroken line of thought and political attitude runs from Marx to Lenin to Stalin. Two, Bolshevism is understood in religious terms. Three, a political life that has lost its transcendent measure can only end in some form of totalitarianism. That's her summary of Gorion. None of these arguments can be found in the origins. And Arndt's review put her squarely in a discourse that was emblematic of the understanding of totalitarianism, then current among a great many of her contemporaries. Totalitarianism, so the reasoning went, is rooted in Christian theology symbols, rites, and rituals that are transfigured into modern secularized terms. Political religions demonstrate the persistence of human religious need and are ultimately a warning against the abandonment of traditional religion. Apparently unwilling to polemicize against Gurion, whom she admired, Arndt pulled her punches and wrote that Gurion's assertions cannot be proved or unproved. But she makes it clear that she does not accept his larger claim that Bolshevism is a substitute for the one true faith, 
a modern heresy growing out of a secularized society. She also left no doubt that her critical but opaque comments about the doctrine of immanentism, that is a phrase he used to mean worldliness, and the one great modern heresy, that is secularism, were directed less at Gourion himself than at Eric Fogelin, who had reviewed Arendt's book in Gourion's review of politics, and who, it is widely accepted, actually invented the notion of political religion in an eponymous book that appeared in Vienna shortly before the Anschluss in 1938. Fergulin's cryptic, convoluted, and erudite elaboration of the relationship between religion and politics, from the cult of Ra in ancient Egypt to the abyss of human nihilism and the earthly desire for fulfillment and modernity, only barely touched on actual totalitarianism. There are a few sentences about Italian fascism in the last few pages. For Fergulin, there is little difference between liberalism, positivism, scientism, and the political religions of the 20th century. With the collapse of the medieval corpus mysticism, communal religions or sects emerged, which were inner-worldly, he called them inner-worldly ecclesia, inner-worldly churches, who believed in fraternity, spiritual intensity, and ultimately in what Fergulin called empires of Satan, Führer, Tum, and Apocalypse. The argument for political religion were not, however, was not, however, restricted to religious conservatives like Fergulin. In 1944, Raymond Aron invoked Tocqueville, Elie Halevi, and Max Weber to argue that liberal democracy represented the antipode to secular religions. Quote, I propose to use the term secular religions he wrote, to designate doctrines that in the souls of our contemporaries take place, it, take the place of the faith that is no longer there, placing the salvation of mankind in this world, in the more or less distant future, and in the form of a social order yet to be invented. Above all, Aron denied that totalitarianism constituted a radically new form of political rule. And he focused instead on how totalitarian terror relied on one-party states, administrative and bureaucratic rationalization, and that it demonstrated a higher degree of flexibility and pragmatism than Arndt allowed. Fergulin's 1953 review of the origins confronted Arndt with a series of problems that she did not address in her book most prominently the distinction between religion and ideology. Yet in the concluding pages, she uncharacteristically remarked on how, and I quote, unable as yet to live without fear and hope, the masses are attracted by every effort which seems to promise a man-made fabrication of the paradise they had longed for. And she noted that just as the popularized features of Marx's classless society have a queer resemblance, this is her phrase, to the messianic age, so the reality of the concentration camps resembles nothing so much as medieval pictures of hell. Fergulin seized on this remark to dramatize his claim, once again, that political religions are the transfiguration and perversion of transcendental perfection into movements devoted to achieving this worldly salvation. Totalitarian movements were not simply revolutionary movements of functionally dislocated people, but, and this is Fergland's phrase, imminentist creed movements in which medieval heresies have come to their fruition. These movements can pervert Christian faith in their claims to alter human nature. And insofar as Arendt thinks such a change in human nature is in fact possible were totalitarianism to succeed, so Fergland argues Arendt herself succumbs to the heresy of imminentism. In her careful reply, she pointed out that the purported affinities between totalitarian movements and Western intellectual and political history obscures the essential distinctions. 
What is unprecedented in totalitarianism, she argued, is not primarily its ideological content, but the event of totalitarian domination itself. Ferdinand's notion of a secular religion that substitutes ideology for traditional beliefs is in effect a functionalization of religious need in new guise. Such formulations, she argued, fail to distinguish the essential thing about the essential about totalitarianism from any other form of government, totalitarian ideology from any other ideology, whether religious or not. In an unsent answer to Fergalin, she conceded that ideologies can to some degree be traced back to the great tradition, intellectual tradition, but what distinguishes totalitarianism is its radicalism, its unflexible logicality, its refusal to be deterred by reality. In other words, ideology per se does not lead to totalitarian terror. Rather, the logical stringency that is inherent in a concept, eliminating any dissonant judgment is what is new and cannot be de derived from the ideologies themselves. The discourse of political religion continued to accompany the reception and criticism of the origins throughout. In September 1953, Arndt published an essay entitled Religion and Politics, in Confluence, a journal edited by the young Henry Kissinger. There she directly addressed the question of whether the struggle between the free and the totalitarian world was in fact a conflict between a new secular religion and the transcendent religious system which alone can resist when resisted. She acknowledged that the theory of communism as a secular religion had in effect brought religion back into po public political affairs. But communism, she claimed, is not a religion. Though it denies the existence of God, it never tries to answer religious questions and does not employ theological arguments about the movement of history. She distinguished two distinct approaches roughly corresponding to those of Fergalin and Aron. One saw a secular religion as, in fact, substantively replacing the, re replacing the old religion as a new religion. The other saw ideology as secular, but nonetheless fulfilling the function of traditional religion. So you have this substance function discussion. To call Bolshevist ideology a religion is to pay it an undeserved compliment, she wrote while overlooking that Bolshevism no longer belongs to the Western tradition. In her Confluence essay, Arndt, this was her way of doing things, Arndt made some intemperate remarks about the French sociologist Jules Monnerot for his totalizing and confusing, those are her words, approach to the political religion problem. Of all Arndt's interlocutors in the political religion debate, Monogho was the most formidable. Unlike Fregelin, whose esoteric hyper-Christian theology did not effectively engage totalitarianism in any specific detail, Monogho was the founder of the Collège de Sociologie, along with Georges Bataille, Roger Carrois, and Pierre Klosowski. A Marx scholar, he was the author of The Sociology and Psychology of Communism. His angry repost in Confluence accused Arendt of misreading Marx, of sloppy writing, and in the end of ignoring the anthropological fact that religion, symbols, and rituals are universal, and that social science, meaning Durkheim, had established that sacred phenomena such as myth, transfiguration, sacrifice, and historical redemption appear in pseudo-scientific totalitarian movements. Arndt responded by once again reiterating that if Marx considered all religion ideology, not all ideology was religion. The purported cure for secular or political religion, the reinvestment of political life with religious passion, was, she warned, a profound danger. Indeed, she wrote, the result may, be very well, may very well be 
the transformation and perversion of religion into an ideology and the corruption of our fight against totalitarianism by a fanaticism which is utterly alien to the very essence of freedom. In short, confining the struggle against totalitarianism to religion, it undermined the legitimacy of a secular foundation for political authority. As Samuel Moyne pointed out, Arndt thought that what was at stake in modernity was leaving religion behind, and conversely, when modernity took its most politically defective forms, it was among other reasons because it had failed to properly make its, necessarily, its necessary break with the religious civilization that preceded it. She readily understood that at times, modern politics indeed needed a secular proxy for what she called religious sanction or divine principle. But here she challenged the notion that politics was always accompanied by a hidden or covert theology, which of course was Carl Schmitt's famous contention in his political theology of 1922. And though there's no evidence that Arndt either, was either in direct or unacknowledged dialogue with Schmidt, the political religion debate brought her within the orbit of his political theology insofar as she defended the possibility of a modern secular politics not sanctioned by religious authority. It is not religion per se, as Schmidt claimed, but in her, ver in her view, secularization that inevitably posed the problem of how to found and constitute a new authority. Schmidt's contention that secular political movements were in effect covert religions had failed to demonstrate the constitutive role of religion apart from mere analogies or resemblances to historical or anthropological thought and action. In 1949, Karl Lewitt who, like Arndt, was a student of Heidegger and Freiburg, published a book entitled Meaning in History, artfully elaborating how all modern philosophies of history were secularized theology, rooted in biblical and Christian doctrines of salvation. Secularization, argued Lewitt, lies at the core of modernity, but not as liberation from Jewish and Christian salvation doctrines, but rather as their transfiguration and realization. And these appeared in multiple temporal guises, such as progress, dialectics, and class struggle, but they always remained the remote and yet intense result of Christian hope and Jewish expectation. If figures like Comte, Proudhon, and Marx, and there are many others in the book, categorically rejected divine providence, they substitute for it a belief in progress that converted religious belief into the, the anti-religious attempt to establish predictable laws of secular history. In the 1950s, Lewitt's book quickly became the accepted standard version of secularization in history. Though he, Lewitt, remained aloof from the reception of his work, which was especially infuriating for Arndt because she objected to the fact that he was so reticent in drawing any larger conclusions. She wrote to Blücher, to get anything positive from him is impossible. He, Lewitt, seemed oblivious to the possibility that the philosophy of history as secularized theology might also admit to an alternative possibility, that disenchantment could engender reenchantment, the approach of Lukács, Bloch, Benjamin, Adorno, and others. Moreover, he did, not, he did not discuss why secularized eschatology can refer to so many diverse phenomena, capitalism, communism, fascism, nationalism, democracy, etc., that its very promiscuity was self-immolating. Adorno, for example, argued that the concept of progress was not delegitimized because it retains, quote, that moment of redemption, which, however secularized, is indelible. The claim that all philosophy of history, in fact, concealed salvation theology also undermined modern thought as counterfeit or illegitimate, as Hans Blumenberg pointed out in his famous controversy with Lewitt in the 1960s. I'll come back to that. 
His textual analyses remained within the history of ideas in the classic sense. But it is obvious that he did regard some salvation narratives as pointing towards political and existential implications. In an article published in 1952, Lewis extended his argument to his teacher. The category of Dasein, so central to Heidegger's philosophy, was a concealed theology, an existential substitution for the pursuit of a transcendent and infinite perfect being that ultimately led, according to Lewis, to nihilism and Nazism. In a letter to Blücher, Arendt noted that by calling Heidegger's concept of history into question, Lewitt, quote, hits a particularly vulnerable point. One critic, however, Carl Schmidt, welcomed Lewitt with open arms, so to speak. In a 1950 review, he effusively praised him, quote, no author instructs us about this matter with greater historical philosophical clarity and better informed intellectual history. That's Schmidt on Lovett. Schmidt characterized Lovett's method as proceeding backwards from philosophy of history to theology of history and finally to eschatology in the Bible, in the Hebrew Bible and in St. Augustine. The modern age with its fetishism of progress and historical development characterized by the, and this is a quote from Schmidt, endowment of meaning for large scale planning is the most recent exp expression of this eschatological heritage. According to Schmidt, everyone who seeks to plan and to bring masses in the train of their planning does so in the name of one form of the philosophy of history or another. In a few tightly argued pages, Schmidt draws out what he sees as the political implications of Lewitt's book. Lewitt does not at all delegitimize the philosophy of history for standing on the shoulders of salvation history. Lewitt's critique, not so much as demystifying the messianic emplotment of history, actually restores its legitimacy and provides political theology with a historical pedigree. History is a noble enterprise, not the story of humanistic self-reflection or what Schmidt calls a mere archive of the past. So diametrically opposed to Lovett's intentions, his argument could and did serve as a historical demonstration of the perceived necessity of a militant restoration of Christian or Occidental values. And Schmidt goes into detail about that. I should add also that during the Cold War, Schmidt's thinking allowed some German historians, for example, Hanno Kesting, and Reinhard Kozelik to see themselves as victims of the Weltbürgerkrieg, a global civil war representing a nation, Germany, that had suffered defeat by the twin competing secular progressivist enlightenment powers, the United States and the Soviet Union. So the secularization thesis was a means of denying the legitimacy of the modern liberal age as one of permanent crisis due to the Promethean self-empowerment of the deluded humanity. Schmidt's unconventional reading of Lovett, you might even say perverse reading of Lovett, highlights the term's conceptual plasticity. Does the idea of secular religion refer to a de-Christianization or to the counterfeit or weak foundations of modern concepts or to the idea that modern thought requires a supplement of religion for legitimacy or to the persistence of religion as an enabler of science and technology run amok. To be sure, Schmidt ignored Lovett's own stoical rejection of all teleological or eschatological conceptions of history. But this lacuna and many elements of his critique were the entry points for Blumenberg's attempt to untangle the multiple strands of secularization theory by insisting that what actually happens in the process that is usually called secularization is not the transfer, the German word is umsetzung, of an authentically theological content into secular self-alienation, but instead the resituating, umbesetzung, of a newly vacant position which could not be eliminated as such. 
The important point is that Bloomberg's skepticism is remarkably close to Arendt's own insistence on the importance of making distinctions as opposed to the almost universal functionalization of all concepts and ideas in the social sciences, specifically the political religion concept. In the origins, Arndt indirectly distinguished her concept of ideology from the secularization thesis. Quote, driven by its exaggerated cogency, logicality, and consistency, ideology is the explanation of all events of the past and the course of all future events until it achieves the transformation of human nature itself. For her, the inability to make distinctions is most evident in the debate on secular religion. And as it was in what she later called the widespread conviction that in the free world that communism is a new religion, notwithstanding its avowed atheism, atheism, because it fulfills socially, psychologically, and emotionally the same function, here's that function problem again, traditional religion fulfilled and still fulfills in the free world. The political religion thesis has shown a remarkable resiliency, especially among contemporary historians, most notably Emilio Gentile, Roger Griffin, Michael Burley. They argue first that mankind seems to have a primordial anthropological longing for the experience of the sacred. Second, that the precondition for, the modern, sec for modern secular religions is the historical retreat of Christianity, dechristianization, and the migration of the sacred beyond the sphere of the traditional churches to the political realm. However, skeptics like Philippe Burin concede that this approach effectively addresses mentalities, representations, emotions, and other archetypal structures, but lacks precision and contains a fundamental ambiguity about the relationship between religion and politics. Focusing on culting aspects, cultic aspects like rituals and beliefs, Burin argues, obscures the political dimension of totalitarianism. And I think this was Arndt's point all along. Multiple confusing definitions of religion and the assumption that excitation or fascination with the divine derives exclusively from the Christian West, as Lerwitt had claimed, contributes to a problematic conclusion that political religion is ultimately an ersatz, or sub substitute, or weak substitute, uh, for Christianity. It's interesting that a challenge to that view came from the historian Richard Stigmund Gall in an extensive study published just a few years ago of the German Christian movement. Gall argued that the compatibility, indeed the syncretism, of Nazism and Christianity demonstrates that ersatz religion arguments are incoherent because there was in fact no substitution for Christianity, but rather an identity between authentic Christianity and the Nazi movement. Racialized Christianity and Nazism were the same thing, pure and simple. Here too, critics invoking the Lerwitz Bloom, this is quite a debate, here too, critics invoking the Lerwitz Bloomberg controversy demonstrate that secularization does not necessarily preclude a bridge between traditional and secular religion that may extend beyond function to an actual secularized religious content as in the German Christian movement. As we have seen, Arndt objected to the political religion thesis on multiple grounds. She rejected the premise that weakening political authority was due solely to the crisis of traditional belief and that religious need was an ontological universal. She questioned whether religion was the source of the eclipse of politics in the modern world and emphasized that totalitarianism as an entirely novel form of rule whose goal was not the satisfaction of religious need was about something far more ominous, indeed the irreligious, anti-utilitarian project of transforming human nature to render human beings superfluous. Another point might be added, and I just add this as a coda in conclusion. Much of the recent research 
on the popular culture of Nazi Germany and Stalinist Soviet Union shows that totalitarianism was largely lacking in the spiritual, mystical, mythical, and sublime aspects of representation embodied in the officially sanctioned architecture, painting, and music of the regime. If you look at films like Triumph of the Will, Olympia, Hitler, Jung, Effects, these were heralded as triumphs of Goebbels' propaganda ministry. But for the mass, vast majority of Germans, Nazi culture was communicated through far less overtly political entertainments, through commercial advertising. And though many of these were hardly devoid of ideological motifs, the political religion thesis is highly selective. It obviates the fact that far more important than the sublime national socialism of the Nuremberg rallies, Bayreuth festivals, Tingplätze, Nordic rituals, and other mythical aspects of the regime, there was a prosaic national socialism. And in the Soviet Union, a vulgar Stalinism of entertainment films, radio, sports, and other common pursuits. In Arendtian terms, the temporary alliance between the mob and the elite was not cemented by pseudo-religious participation, but by the withdrawal into the private realm of sex, into reading, crossword puzzles, card playing, drink, and all of which permitted the dictatorship to appear less threatening and more hospitable. For example, Arndt focused on the, how the de judaization of German public culture was realized through the subtle interplay of legal discourse, pedagogical incitement, civil apartheid, and scientific racism based on what she called a loose consensus about the, eth the ethnic organism, Volkskörper. This prosaic totalitarianism explains its capacity to empty out all political solidarity, in effect to destroy what she called the very capacity for experience. Thank you.